and he's mushing in 1963. Mitch's dad, Dan, ran the very first Iditarod in 1973. So he decided that he wanted to run the Iditarod some, someday. Please welcome Mitch Seavey coming down the chute. Kind of the main lead this trip. Okay, Mitch is coming up. We're checking the gear on his sled. Make sure he has all the required things needed. <clears throat> Mitch, do you have your vet book? Yes, I do. Vet book. Okay. And sleeping bag. Uh, yep, I see it up there. Hand axe. Got it. Snowshoes, see those already. Promotional packet. Cooker. Got it. Booties. I see him. Okay. Mitch has all his required gear. And the only thing we need from him right now is his signature to officially sign him off the trail. Right there. Pencil's kind of broken, so. Okay, Mitch Seavey coming in in second place, bib number 27, and he came in in nine days, 16 hours, 15 minutes, and 38 seconds.
Congratulations, Mitch. Welcome to Nome. race you have to ask about the team what is it about this year's teams that makes it so special for you? well it's kind of a rebuilding team there's a lot of youngsters in here uh, the youngest dogs we usually race on the a team are three-year-olds and there's a bunch of them in here and they're just really show re really good promise for the future super tough super happy and uh, so we started out taking it a little bit easy but we saw that those dogs have the maturity to really race at a high level, so we, we went ahead and made a push for the front. Um, very special team. We noticed that uh, that you were starting off this year, and then you made a very large push towards the end of the race. Looking at that last leg over from White Mountain past Safety Roadhouse, coming along the Eastern Norton Sound and up through the Norton Sound, what was it that gave you that final push? What, what was the strategy there? Or what was just the power? Well. Actually, we didn't make so much of a push as we were just very fortunate and blessed that the dog team didn't slow down. But there's a secret strategy to that because most people know that the dogs will run faster if they get more rest. And I was looking at all the 20-something and 30-something-year-old guys and gals, and they were planning their rest stops, and they were going to stay two and a half hours or maybe three hours and 45 minutes. And I said, well, I think I'm going to do like them. I'm going to stay three hours and 45 minutes. And then... I had to clean my glasses and get a couple more cups of coffee and some dry socks. And eventually it was four hours and 30 minutes before I left. But it turns out being over 60 and taking 45 minutes extra rest must have helped us out. <laughs> yeah, we do have to wish you a very sweet 60. This is, this is quite the achievement. Uh, one last question for you. Obviously, coming from such a legacy of dog mushers, you've read it that I did read several times. Your dad ran in the 70s. And of course, your your kids are also showing promise in that regards as well. What does this mean for you? Put in that context of you being a family of mushers. Well, it, it means I have a, a pretty good support base, <laughs> and uh, and a lot of a lot of moral support, and a lot of uh, people that are interested in. And and it's good, you know, when something like this happens, where obviously we didn't win, and congratulations to Thomas, but we feel like we had a pretty good race, and and it's it's good to have somebody feel proud of you. Uh, and, and pay attention and care about what you're doing. And I think whichever generation, older and younger, we've all done that for each other. And, and it, it makes it special to be able to do this as a family. Yeah, and congratulations on that as well. It is also worth a uh, asking, there's so many questions going on right now here in Nome about, uh, you know, if you've heard the COVID-19 has been coming around, something's changed a lot going on here. Is that something that was on anyone's mind on the trail? Were you focused on the next mile? not really worried about what was going on outside of that. I didn't notice anything. Uh, <laughs> some of the checkpoints were affected too, though, along the trail and that, but I felt like I'm not going to get it from a dog, so I'm pretty safe. <laughs> you might have been the safest place in the world. Congratulations, Mitch. It's All a right. wonderful finish. Thank you. Mitch, tell me about the competition. Tell me about Thomas. What did you notice in him? This is only his second I did a rod, and he won the race. Uh, what are your thoughts about how he raced? I, I didn't really get a chance to observe him very much, honestly, and uh, it might be disappointing, but I'm not that much of a of a stats guy or, uh, you know, as far as keeping track of what's going on. I'm doing doing well to take take care of my own schedule and see what I'm doing. I saw Thomas's dogs a couple times, and they looked really, really fluid, big, strong dogs. Um, so I don't have much to, to comment on other than... Uh, he obviously did a great job. He got he got us by several hours, and that's uh, I guess that's not easy to do. And also, how how difficult was it to stay ahead of Jesse? It's never easy. <laughs> um, again, as far as the competition between the mushers, you know, it becomes obvious even. Uh, two or three or four runs ago, everybody knows who's got the fastest teams and, and how, how we're likely to stack up and, and, and barring some, uh, tr some, you know, tragedy that nobody wants to see for anybody. Uh, we all sort of have a feel for how things are going to shake out and, and Jesse and I have been sort of together, but I've been out running her each run and it was obvious that I was out running her each run. And so even today, as I was 
counting down to take off from White Mountain, Jessie came over and helped me with a couple of dog uh, vet care issues. She had some special remedies, and she was all over it helping my dogs. And and uh, obviously, she would be the first one to benefit if my team were to falter. But it's always about dog care, and and so keeping ahead of her, we just run in our respective races in parallel universes. I think. Was there a point where you felt like you could catch Thomas, and then? At what point did you realize that it wasn't going to happen? There never was a point. Once I started moving up the, the stats, you know, from New Lotto and moving up, I, there never was a point at which I thought I can really, really go get this guy. Um, it's a matter of getting there as fast as we can. Yeah, the, uh, when I was going through Elam, I gave it a thought, but the thing that keeps the dog team fast is resting, not skipping rest. So even if I would have been able to skip enough rest and somehow make contact with him, I would not have still been driving the same dog team that, that was capable of, of racing. So it wasn't to be, and um, I'm very satisfied. My dogs don't know the difference. They're proud of themselves, and I'm proud of them too. Thanks, Mitch. Okay, Mitch, well, welcome to Gnome. And if you need any help getting out of the chute, we got plenty of people here to help. Congratulations. Congratulations to Mitch CV in second. Uh, Mats Patterson, uh, you're still with us live for, from Sweden. Uh, what will you say about this uh, this uh, guy here, Mitch CV? Yeah, Mitch, as I told, is a really experienced uh, musher, been in the business a uh, long time, and has so very good bloodlines and genetics and he's been working so great the last years and is constantly top uh, five four three i think uh, dallas told the other average of 3.4 something like that the last 10 years or something so it's, it's pretty remarkable pretty amazing uh, to see him year after year and this year with a great team coming into the front street in home and it was just beautiful to see i think Yes, uh, I, I, say, I saw that uh, the the last 15 times he has participated, he's been at the top 10. So, uh, and he has uh, won three times before. Yeah, that, that say everything about uh, dog care, taking care of dogs, having a great team coming into the finish, uh, looking good. And, and this year was a bit special race for him because he told it was a bit, uh, from beginning, he was a bit back behind 15 place in Nolado and then he just past team of the team on the trail because they had a faster team and had good rest in the dogs. So this is a different way of running the running the race this year for him, I guess. But I don't think it was planned. It's just like coming up like that uh, because of something happened in the beginning. The team wasn't there and then you settle in and they just get so strong in the in the end, the finish. I think we saw from the maybe Juno athlete and after that that he was maybe the only threat to Thomas recovering, thinking that he had a little bit faster team like and than the other ones, so he can catch. But he rested and he rested in Elim and he he needed that rest for getting his dogs to run in that pace that they they wanted to do. And it talked so much about having a great team in to know how much important it was for him to do that. And he, he succeeded with that. Yes, because how how big part is that of, of the sport of dog mushing uh, to to deal with the issues and problems you get along the way? That's a really huge thing, you know, and but it's coming more with experience. You can see many of the mushers they get a real low because they have some issues at the beginning of the race and then it's just like change it, change, uh, take it easy by the dogs, give them the food they need, give them the rest they need and so on because this is so long race so you can actually have some problems at the beginning of the race, do some mistakes and so on, but anyway, come back and be strong. And this is really a proof of that this year with Mish team. 
And with us live, we also have uh, Trun Örslian, a measher from Norway. Hi and welcome to you. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? You've been uh, been training uh, a lot with uh, with Thomas Werner, right? Yeah, we've been uh, good friends for uh, many, many years. And um, uh, I, I, we had a team together when uh, he, you know, he's a former sprint musher. And he was one of the, the best sprint mushers in the world, actually. But uh, he wanted to go for long distance instead. And uh, in that process, we, we became friends. And um, I saw that he, he really had some small issues by uh, convert from sprint to long distance. That's, uh, that's a totally different things. So um, so we became um, partners in a way. So I helped him a little bit with uh, some advices and some uh, genetics for, uh, for the long distance. And he helped me a lot by organizing so I could uh, race as well. So we helped each other for some years uh, and uh, he was a very good help for me. And uh, I helped him a lot as well. So I know him pretty well, yeah. <laughs> uh, what can you say about Thomas's drive and passion for dog mushing? Where did, does it come from? <clears throat> you know, Thomas has been working as a handler in Alaska way back when he was a very young boy. And he always had an extremely drive and passion for dogs. That has been there his whole life. Uh, and uh, he has been, as a sprint musher, or even if you're a sprint musher or a long distance musher, the drive for the dogs and, and um, the willing to win is, is almost the same. Uh, so um, I've been learning a lot from him. He's a 100% uh, dog man and uh, he got enormous contact and respect for his dogs. And um, uh, it's extremely important for him that uh, his dogs is feeling and doing well. How big is it for Thomas this moment to be the champion of Iditarod 2020? I... <laughs> We always been talking about the Adidrod, and uh, and we uh, when we had a team together, he started that he uh, that was around ten years ago, and uh, I, I pulled out of the team because uh, I was retiring a little bit and doing my family uh, uh, establish a family, uh, and he wanted to go on for the Adidrod, uh, and um, so so he went on on his own. So from there on, I'd only helped him a little bit with some genetics and and supported him a little bit, but uh, <clears throat> he has been planning this very, very well from uh, almost 10 years, I think. And he had this uh, rookie run some five, five years ago, uh, where he also did very well and became rookie of the year. And from then he came on and uh, he has been brooding a completely new team from, uh, from, uh, from the last time he was here. Uh, and um, that team has been read and trained, run, and he has been thinking about the idea all the time, and he has always, uh, and uh, he has been taking snow machines and traveling and following other measures, so he should know the trail very well. Uh, I think Aditra has been in his mind every day the last ten years. I think so. This is probably one of the biggest days in his life, uh, for sure. It must take a lot of preparations uh, for him to to do this, and uh, and that's that's a lot of years. Mats, uh, what are your thoughts? <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. So from from when we grow up, and if you running what we did in the long distance and so on, the dream is ultimately the dream is to go over and do the editor and do the trail there and so on. But I have a question. More time on the red. He was more. Uh, you can see that now this year he was so focused. Everything is selling more, and that year. It's cold weather also. You, that's maybe also better prepared dogs for this race actually. So, what is your comment about the bloodlines and the dog strand? Um, I had a little bit bad connections. Could you re could you could you give me that question again in a short term, please? What did you ask me about, Mats? Yeah, yeah. What, what is uh, for uh, Thomas? I see his team 2015 also, but I see the dog changed a bit in his team. I see he got a little bit more well coated dogs and other type of dogs. This um, for prepare for this uh, 2020 Adidas. So, what do you, can you say more about his dog and his team? Um, what Thomas has been doing. 
is that he has been digging down to the old bloodlines in, in Norwegian uh, long distance mushing. And uh, when he was running, remember he was winning Finnmark's race back to 2013, I think. And he went for the Adidrad. And uh, so after the Adidrad, his dogs started to get old. So he, he was planning a new generation of dogs. And there he took the knowledge from Finnmark's race and uh, Adidrad. And he took his best bloodlines. And he started to make um, uh, his own bloodline. And uh, very specific, he's been breeding on one dog, one bloodline. He has been sticking to it. So he has his own bloodline now, which he knows very well. And the basic thing, the basic in that bloodline is that that's very, very old, long distance lines from uh, from other mushrooms in Norway. And he has been mixing them in a, in a special way. Uh, and so, so almost all the dogs in the, the team to Thomas is bred exactly in the same way. And they've been breeding specifically to go Finnmark and I did Road Trail. And they're a little bit bigger, they're a little bit better coat, but um, <clears throat> the most important thing in this breed is that they have some incredible endurance. So uh, he has been breeding extremely much at um, dogs that never get tired and dogs that don't run too fast and dogs who always eat well and all that. So a lot of those things has comes actually from, from Greenland dogs. So there's <laughs> there's a lot of both Siberian Husky and Greenland dogs in, in Thomas uh, Thomas uh, Thomas team. He Thomas has said that yeah, where, uh, where? Yeah, his uh, dogs uh, they they are meant for pulling uh, that they pull really well. Is this uh, something that Greenland dogs yeah. is known for? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, yes, that's right. And I remember when we started to train. Uh, when he was training for his first long distance races, he was training just like he was doing sprint. So he had a very easy sled and it was, he was going very fast as his training runs. And when he came to the race, he was very fast just the first two days and then he had to scratch. So he was looking at what I was doing and I was, I was training very small teams and I had extremely heavy sled. So, um, so, so now he started to do that himself. He has a big, 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 big concrete block in his sled. Uh, 55 kilos plus another stuff. So he's training in uh, in where he lives in Sinfjell. It's uh, always wind, always soft uh, trails and a lot of hills up and downs. So that's what uh, he does every training trip. He um, he um, he trains with the heavy sled, very slow, uh, terrible soft trails and lots of ups and downs. So um, and he has also been breeding for pulling very very hard. So I guess that uh, <clears throat> that's typical for the Greenland dog and pull very hard also as well, I think. Thank you. Um, Mats, um, Mats uh, do you, uh, can you relate to this? Oh yeah, thanks for the good information, Tron. Nice to hear. And I just see like, uh, I think this team is, uh, we're talking about this trail was in Tuma's favor, but it, I just feel like this team was strong. It doesn't matter which trail it was this year, he will probably win anyway, because it looks like he had the best team, the best dogs, and everything worked out for him this year. So it's uh, very, inter very interesting to hear how he changed into a bit more pulling dogs, a bit slower and so on pace and uh, it really was a success for this race and for, for genetic in, in my way to see it. Really beautiful dogs. But um, <clears throat> just uh, uh, another thing with this Greenland lines is that uh, we I saw that myself before I had a, a pure team a pure uh, team of Alaskan Huskies and then I start to, to breed with these lines and I saw that these dogs they they could they don't need so much rest. So, so when, when the normal Alaskan Husky sled dog gets sour and, and needs to sleep and stop to eat, then it's just to go on with this kind of dog. So they have, they don't go so extremely fast, but they can work on, uh, you can cut rest and you don't lose so much speed. That's the basic thing with this, uh, these bloodlines. And as we saw at the end of the race, very interesting actually, Everybody thought that Thomas was going to losing some speed when he cut two hours. When he, he only rested two hours in Ilim, and we saw, for example, Mitch Sivi and the other top mushers, they was resting three hours, and everybody thought that Thomas was going to losing some speed because he was cutting rest in Ilim down to only two hours. 
But uh, what happened? You saw that Thomas, he, he had, has the fastest run time from Elim. So he was resting less and running faster than the other teams at the end of a race. And, and, uh, so, uh, and if you look at the run times from White Mountain to safety, he's all, also one of the fastest. So, um, so, so that's, I think some of, some of the reason for that is in the genetics, I think. Uh, I've heard that... Absolutely, uh, 100% yes. copy that, yes, absolutely. So because just the recycling thing about coming back from a short rest and be ready to go again is one of the main key for this race of the dogs, absolutely. Yes, because we were all surprised when, when we saw that he didn't rest that much in Elam, but he said that uh, I, I know them, <laughs> he knows his dogs, that they, they were able to do it. Yeah, this is uh, this is also something that is a little bit different. We have the these long distance races. We have the Feynman race and the Finnmark race, and especially in the Finnmark race, which Thomas actually was winning last year. He had a very dominant win in Finnmark's race as well last year. He had the biggest team to the finish line. He had the fastest run time on the last legs of the race, and um, and in Finnmark, it's um, even more extreme culture on cutting rest at the end of the race. So uh, much more than they do in the Adid Road, actually. In the Adid Road, they, the trail is so hard, so they need much rest to, to keep up high speed at the end. Mitch Seavey is specialist at that. But, uh, but uh, in Finnmark, where Thomas uh, has the race, Thomas has been winning two times. There is a lot tougher at the end. You're cutting more rest, and the trail is, is very much soft, and it's a lot of ups and downs. So this year, for Thomas, the, the end of the race was just like uh, uh, the end of a Finnmark race, I think. Can you tell us a little bit? Uh, I've heard that, that Thomas, he he was living in Oslo, but he, he early on had this urge uh, to discover the sport of dog mushing and get into it. Uh, am I right that he, he, yeah, he was... He was. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Tron. Yeah, uh, Thomas was actually grew up in Oslo, and he started to to look at some dogs in in, in parks in Oslo. But uh, he was, I guess, he was 16 or 17 years when he went to Alaska, and he started to work at uh, the kennel to Roxy Wright, I think. And uh, there he had a very good school, so he um, he was there for uh, for uh, for uh, for a good period of times. And uh, at the same period, he also was with uh, some of the best sprint mushers in Norway as a handler. So, so, we, so he has many years as a handler with the very best dog people in the world. We're talking about Roger Legor and, and Roxy right here. So uh, he obviously learned something from, from some of the best uh, uh, dog mushing uh, people in the world. Uh, and uh, he came back uh, early in the 20s and then he, um, he, he moved up to a cabin that actually belonged to his grandfather uh, up in the hills in Sundfjell. Uh, and uh, he established a, a sprint kennel up there in a very young age. Uh, and uh, he always run dogs. So, so, um, so, so, so he has been, he's been always been in, 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 the, in the dog mushing uh, business for, uh, uh, yeah, since he was 16 years, I think. He's been going all in and been training dogs almost every day in his whole life since. But it's so many mushers who participate their entire life, or like year after year after year, and they do get good positions in Iditarod, but they, they don't win. What does it take to win? Why did Thomas win this year? Uh, I guess maybe Mats uh, can answer that question better than me, because he is very experienced at that specific race, but I think uh, um, Thomas, this, this victory that Thomas now had, from my point of view here in Norway, I think this is a historic big victory, because um, I've been following this race for, uh, for many years, and, and um, Thomas is winning the Aditarod, he, he, he wins with, with over five hours. I mean, you have to go many, many years back in time before you see a team that has been had a that big lead into the finish line in Nome. And another aspect that hasn't been mentioned yet, as far as I have heard, that Thomas he has a non-experienced team on the Adidrad. And um, everybody knows who has been in the, in the race for a long time that to have an experienced team 
in that specific race, that's a great advantage. And I see that other people who is winning the Editorod, they usually have dogs that has been going to the finish line at least once, one time before. And when we now look at this team to Thomas, no one of his dogs has ever seen Alaska. It's the first time they are there. So that he could win with some totally non-experienced dogs, that I think is, um, that's, uh, that's a big victory. So, Thank you, uh, so he, he has a dominant win. Yes, that's. Uh, we will continue to talk about that. We have Dallas Seavey with us live from Nome, and we just saw uh, Mitch Seavey coming in to a second. All right, hello Maria. I'm uh, here in Nome. We just uh, moved down from the start or from the finish line down to the dog yard area. So behind me, this is the area the dogs will be camping for the next day or two before flying back to Anchorage and then from there on to their home. So um, they've got the kennels set up where the dogs will be sleeping here. The veterinarians just did the check here in uh, Nome, uh, looking at each dog before they get bedded down, and they'll be working with the handlers to help make sure the dogs have everything they need for the next few days. So um, we have. Mitch over here just came in. We just watched him finish a little bit ago. Uh, he's getting some of the things out of his sled, so we can go say hi to him real quick, and then it's going to be off to bed for him probably for the next, uh, I don't know, 16, 17 hours if, I, <laughs> if history says anything. All right. Hey, Dad. How you doing? <laughs> we're going to ask you just a couple questions, okay. then we're going to go to bed. <laughs> All right. All right. So first of all, obviously, uh, you're here. What, what I did, Rod, number is this. I'm gonna guess 26. I think no, no, it's 27th on my. Tw the, I got bib 27. Should be able to remember 27th <laughs> run. That one's good. Well, we've been watching pretty close. I mean, this is 27th run and another awesome finish. You're kind of the the old guy in that lead pack <laughs> that we were watching going along and. Um, it was really fun to watch this team progress mm -hmm. up there. In many ways, they'd kind of written you off on the Yukon River. You know, the people on the field weren't really talking much about the guy back there in 20th. But then coming up the coast, just one team after the next, it seemed almost systematic. Yeah. What was what was kind of your mindset going through that as you were moving up the coast? Well, once you find yourself sort of out of the front pack almost, you have to figure out what your weapons are and what you can rely on. And I knew that this dog team was super tough and they're capable of being fast. And so speed is kind of relative in a year like this with a lot of snow, but we kept resting them and feeding them and taking care of them well enough that they could keep their speed. And, and uh, lo and behold, they stayed faster than the other teams around us and others just started falling off. So um, it was really something from the from the standing on the runners to just each run to outrun everybody and, and pick off a couple more and, and move up the, the rankings. So uh, there was no particular strategy other than give plenty of rest and take super good care of the team. So I think as we were watching the race, that was one of the things that seemed to stand out a little bit is that watching you race, it seemed like you knew what you were doing and what you wanted to do. How much of that is, you know, the strong suit is that you've you're on race number 27 here and a lot of a lot of the guys not all of them but a lot of the guys you were around, around have done five to ten um how does that change the race when you're racing out there yeah you, so we, we try to have a nice spreadsheet as you know and have everything all figured out with the numbers and by the halfway through the first run almost you can see that isn't going to work you know so yeah you have to have the experience, I think, and the underpinnings to know, like, well, is, is four hours a long rest or is six hours a long rest? Or if I cut a little bit and take three or what's going to happen you know, to be able to predict. But I think for me, it's the overriding philosophy of take care of the dogs first and keep your speed. And that that helped to guide, you know, it's hard to sit there when people were... I mentioned something earlier. They're leaving on two and a half and three hours of rest, and I'm getting further and further behind and still committed to taking four and four and a half. But I think that's how it really pays off, and, and I think patience does come with the age part. Now, there are some sections out there with this deep, soft snow that were clearly tough to get through. So is that a factor on the other side where you got some of the guys out there that are, you know, maybe your your children's age <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure who i'm thinking of there but you have some of them out there do you think that makes a difference for them or i mean i guess would you trade experience for youth i guess let's put it real simple i would not trade in a racing scenario i would not trade because i have found now that and by the way i feel better at the finish of this race than i felt 
almost ever. And I think it's because I just don't freaking run. I don't pedal very little. I, I did some today, long run today. I do a little bit, but I don't go out there and destroy myself. I'm taking after my dad. He's in his 80s. It's the dog's job to pull the sled. And you know, it's really true. So you work that into your breeding, your training, your nutrition. Have a big, powerful dog, 65, 60 to 65 pound males. What do I got to get off the sled for? So I, I don't think I miss too much on that. You know, and that's, uh, I would say from the outside, we watched this race very closely every step of the way. And I was talking to Bruce and Greg along the way and, and other people, you know, from the outside looking in that were able to watch the live images and commentate on it. Um, what stood out was you knew what you're doing with this dog team and you knew what the trail would bring in an experience aspect. But it never was a factor from the outside looking in that, oh, he's having trouble in the hills. No, you were just as quick as everybody else when it came to doing stuff in the checkpoints, and it seems like that experience is why, you know, when we saw a pack of 10 mushers in Uniclete, and it was a coin toss for who was going to come out in second and who was going to come out in 10th, um, I think you had pretty much the best of both worlds there. So, yeah. anyway, we got to get you to bed. So yeah. get the rest of your stuff All out of right. your sled. Good work. All right, thank you. Thanks uh, a lot. All right. Well, we're going to let him uh, get his gear out of there. We have to go up, find a warm place to lay down. You know, it's in the middle of the middle of the morning now. You gotta remember, we're having a coherent conversation more or less, and uh, this was a 12-plus hour run coming in here, and this is the end of a nine and a half day race. I mean, and that's that's what you gotta go through, and that's the mindset you've gotta be able to be in to still operate. You don't need to have the high highs and then crash at the end. And I think that's another thing that I've seen with some of the more experienced mushers on the race that I've had to race against, my dad included. They're steady. They're never gonna be that bubbly, happy, bouncing around in the checkpoint, but they're never down in the ditch either. They're just always steady. They're they're the musher their dog team needs every single day along the way. So, anyway, Mitch Sevian here in second place at the end of the Iditarod, 60-plus years old, fantastic race here. And I think it just brings it full circle that this sport is about coaching. Yes, it helps to be an athletic musher. Yes, it helps to be able to get your team down the trail. But if you are athletic and fit enough, which clearly he is, then the next one is how well do you coach that team? And when you look at any major sport, you don't see 20-year-old coaches on the sideline as the head coach. You see guys that have been out there and done this 27 times down the trail. So, anyway... I'm pretty impressed here, obviously. Obviously, I'm probably a little bit biased as well. <laughs> but um, super proud of him, having just finished in second place. A phenomenal race there. So anyway, that was Mitch Sevi and Noam. We're going to send it back to Norway. Thank you. And, uh, and Mats, uh, can you relate to this? Do you feel like a coach when you, uh, you're out there with your dogs? 100 percent, 100 percent, and it's nice to see Dallas interview his daddy, dad there, and someone's feeling like the strong bonds with, because they know how much work it is between to come to where they are and the ultimate goal of the year, doing a detour, coming in, in a good way into the finish line and Mitch did it awesome. So absolutely, it's a coach, but it's also like being the guy that know the dogs, see the dogs every day in the yard, know exactly when they have some issues and fix the issues on the trail, rechange the schedule, rechange the food, whatever you need to do be done. And this is the the master of that. Mitch is absolutely one of the best dog musher in the world. And uh, yes, like we hear here, uh, Mitch is very famous uh, in the sport of dog mushing. And uh, Trun, uh, uh, what do you think we can learn from the CVs? Oh, we always have something to learn. And uh, the CVs has been in Norway on Symposiums. We have been invited Mitch over for some years ago. So the, every musher in Norway came and, and was sitting to listening to, to him talking to us about dog mushing. And we get we got a lot of, of learnings from that. And we still have a lot to learn. We always have a lot to learn. But for them, it's a culture. It's a lifestyle. You know, in, in Norway and Scandinavia, many of us just have, uh, have uh, a smaller number of dogs and have families and jobs. And this is more like... Uh, we don't go that all in, but in Alaska, it's much more than a lifestyle. And uh, so, so we, I, I still think we have a way to go, uh, and especially to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. And it's it's been quite a race. Uh, uh, Mats, uh, compared to the other, you've participated in the, the six previous races. Uh, what makes this race uh, unique? 
Uh, I'll be really honest to you, so I raced it six times. I started in Anchorage, I started in Fairbanks, I ran the northern route, I ran the southern route, I ran through Huslia. I, I we did, it was different race every year. Even if I had six time run, I did throw, the race was different from year to year. We have wind, we have warm weather, we have storm, we have no snow, we have everything. So this is a deep road and this is what it's all about. You know, this year's also race, they started up with cold weather, lots of snow, and then suddenly it was warm. They can run in just shirt on outside there. And so this is a deep road and this is the race. It's over so long time it's, and uh, so many days and covering area up in the, in the mountains, on the ocean and everything like that. And that's what made me want to go back there any day again, just to to be there, be part of it, and feel the passion over there. It must be some days or hours that's extremely hard, but looking back at these races, what is it that you remember the best? It's the thing like you can do it together only with the team and you have no support. It's just you and the dogs, which I like very much. You have, you have vets on the checkpoints that help you out and so on, but it's you and the dogs who go from one point to another in Alaska and cross Alaska. And for me, that's the strongest feeling, you know. You are out there in the wilderness, you see some cabins with lights, you feel you are alone there on the river, on the Yukon River, you are alone there, it's you and the dogs who are going to coach them, you cross the tough weather, storms and everything like that. And when you come in the end of the race to Cape Nome and can see, see Nome there in the horizon, and you just feel that we did this together, we did this as a team together. I'm the coach, they're doing the toughest work there, but I just make it, this run as good as possible for them, give them the best treatments, take care of them best and see happy dogs. I must say this year on this race, I'm so happy to see so much good looking dogs. So many good dogs, so many good teams, well rested teams. And uh, for me, as a really dog lover and so on, I, I'm really happy to see Iditor also develop year after year to be a better and better race for dog care. Everybody stick to that and everybody just be better to take care of the dogs and do good work. So uh, that made me really happy. Yes, because it's a, a big pride in having a, a good looking team e over the, the finish line, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think you can hear Mitch also told the same thing that this was so important for him. He didn't want to push them in the end. He just want to make them to be a good team coming to the finish line, happy team coming to the finish line, and he just he just proceeded and he he run the race exactly like that. He could push them a little bit more. He could take away some rest from them to try to to come uh, closer to Thomas. But in the end, this was the best way for him to finish with his team into Nome in a good way. It was not to cutting rest and come closer to Thomas. Anyway, he maybe would come farther down the the pack if he did it. So he just know exactly how he could do with this team, and he did the best with his team and come to the finish line with loping dogs, which is really wonderful. Yes, uh, loping is that uh, we can we can look at the picture here uh, that they <coughs> sort of run. <laughs> Yeah, the, the CV dogs have a little bit different gait. I mean, they're not really trotters and so on that way. They have a little bit different gait when they're running. So it's like between trotting and loping a little bit like that. But you see, they're moving fast, they're running fast, they're looking good, their ears are up and they're, they're happy. There's not a dog team that's just walking into Nome. There's a dog team that's happy to come to the finish line. And so that, that's good. And we're lucky that it's uh, it's daytime for us uh, in Europe, so uh, so we can watch this here. And we see that there's still a few uh, spectators uh, in Nome who is uh, up in the middle of the night to cheer for him. <coughs> How is the the environment and uh, the uh, ambience in uh, in Nome? Uh, to be honest, Maria, to see this now pulling into Nome with so less people and everything like how it should be, it's a little bit depressing. I mean, of course, everything with the coronavirus and everything affected everybody, but this town, this town really heads up and everybody just happy. When I did is all the pubs are open, everybody just cheering out each other, seeing there for all the teams coming in, we're running out on Front Street to see teams in the middle of the pack come in and everything like that. And this really quietness there, you can really feel on it and see how, how it is. Make There's a little bit different feeling for sure to not be to be there this year than former years. Like I've been there many times. I've been there when I not raced also 2010 when Lance Mackey won and so on. It was amazing with people all over Nome, all over to just come and cheer everybody up and uh, be happy and have a really big party. Everybody when coming in after the race. So 
So it for sure is a different year or in that case for this race and the finish line in Nome and for Nome community and the, the city of Nome. Uh, and um, and uh, yeah, it's been it's been a different year, but uh, but we have some pictures of uh, I did Rod 2020 and Thomas Werner's uh, race this year. And uh, earlier, Trund, uh, you mentioned that Thomas just raced Iditarod with uh, dogs, new dogs, who has never run this trail before. Uh, that's uh, quite impressive. Yeah, Trund, it's yeah. uh, extremely um, impressive when we look at the statistic and we see what uh, the other mushrooms regular are doing. If you want to win the Iditarod, you pick dogs that has experience. And uh, uh, I also know that uh, when, you, when you're closing up to the finish line in the long races, that uh, the, you are so tired. And when the dogs know exactly where they are and they know um, that uh, this is uh, closing up to the finish line, they often speed up a little bit. That definitely helps. So you has an uh, advantage. It, uh, the, there is an advantage if you have experienced dogs, uh, I think at least. Uh, but. Um, when you do this uh, dogs that is never Alaska or never seen the trail before these dogs they didn't know they was coming to the finish line when they went up front street they, because they never done it before so uh, i think that's uh, very impressive and I, I think you have to go long back in time if uh, if uh, we see a kid uh, no experience from a little before that uh, i don't know if it's uh, even happened before Mats, uh, what is your thoughts on, on this? Is it an advantage to have dogs who has raced it before? Absolutely. I copy that 100% what Tron telling because it's, it's really impressive to win a litro, but it's even more impressive to win a litro with, without any dog who do, did the trial before, especially if you come in the end of the race. In the middle, uh, like beginning and middle of the race, it's not so big a factor, but in the end of the race, when you are in, in uh, close to the finish line, they used to pick up and so on and, and be stronger. So absolutely, I copy that 100%. But there was also some other team this year who didn't have, like, I know Mitch also had pretty much uh, young dogs and he said not any but he had some experienced dogs brand says i think he has one dog around the editor this year and so on so 
I think there's been changing a little bit before we always talked about you have to have this leader. You have to have this leader who done it before. But absolutely, I think it helps you a lot, especially as a rookie. It helps you a lot to have this experienced dog that you can count on in the end of the race and so on. So, But I don't see, even if Tuma has done this race two times, he's a very experienced musher and he lots so much knowledge and uh, experience from, from races all over since he was young. So that helps a lot for having a a team who with dogs who hasn't run this race before. And uh, uh, this uh, exchange from knowledge, uh, Norwegians and Scandinavians, Swedish, uh, often look to Iditarod and look to America for, for knowledge. Uh, is it healthy for the, the, the dog sport of dog machine to have a, a Norwegian to win so that uh, both nations can can keep each other's uh, on their toes. <laughs> Trun, what do you, are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, you know that's uh, Alaska and the Didrod, Nome. That's uh, that's where the, the sled dog, the long distance sled dog, is coming from. And and you know in Norway we had the first long distance race in 1981. I know they had maybe in Sweden they have a, 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 another dog race a little bit earlier. But this sport is very very young in Norway, and it um, it, it but 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 we. We 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 speeding up, uh, you know. In this world, we we are we are very quick to get the knowledge and get the, the equipment and the, and we, the races now in the long races in Scandinavia is, is more and more similar to the Ditterrad. Uh, so um, the the sport is young in Norway, but uh, now maybe we have a change. I don't know exactly, but we will see that. Um, there's still a, a big difference between the races in 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 Norway uh, and the 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 landscape is more ups and down it's another climate we are farther north and uh, we are more up in the mountains there's another snow condition so there will always be some difference between the Ditterrad and and the, the the races in the north of Scandinavia i think uh, and you see it in in the type of dogs thomas he has more typical scandinavian long distance dogs they are uh, they are a little bit heavier, a little bit bigger, and they can deal excellent good with, with tough trail conditions. Uh, so, uh, But we had uh, Dallas Seavey was coming over and running the Finnmark race a couple of years ago. He did pretty well with his own dogs, so it's, get, it's getting more and more similar, I think. Yes. Do you agree to that, Mats? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hello, yes. Uh, Mats, uh, we were talking about that uh, it's, it is getting more similar, uh, the dog marching uh, sport in between, between uh, Alaska and, uh, and Norway and Sweden and Scandinavia. Is, do you uh, agree to that? I, I agree to that, but I also think what one big thing about changing the sport here also in Alaska, it was actually Robert and the teams coming up before, like early in 2000. Because back in the days, it was always talk about uh, there being like you have to have big kennels and everything like that and so on. But also about the uh, welfare of the dogs, everything like that. It's increasing from year to year. I've been also in Alaska many years before that, and I can see the standard of taking care of the dogs, the standard of equipment, their own clothing, houses, everything like that. Kennels are improving every year. They've been better and better. So in that case, actually, Scandinavia has been a, a country who's like, and with caring of the dogs and so on, maybe be in the front there, but to consider the thing like going on races and so on, there's a little different uh, thing over there because people are just living all this. This is 100% passion and knowledge and what they do is for, for a living. And we have ordinary works, people here, and we do other stuff. And so I think that's the biggest difference there. But there have been just the thing like helping each other and seeing and being in races in Scandinavia and Alaska and so on is from both sides. We helped each other to be better mushers over in Scandinavia and over in Alaska in both way. That's uh, that's great. And uh, a few minutes ago, uh, I talked to Dallas CV. Hi, hey Dad, how you doing? <laughs> we're gonna ask you just a couple questions, okay. then we're gonna go to bed. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. So first of all, obviously uh, you're here. What what I did rod number is this? I'm gonna guess 26. I think no, no, it's 27th on my tw the, I got bib 27. Should be able to remember 27th <laughs> run. 
That one's good. Well, we've been watching pretty close. I mean, this is 27th run and another awesome finish. You're kind of the, the old guy in that lead pack <laughs> that we were watching going along. And um, it was really fun to watch this team progress mm -hmm. up there. In many ways, they'd kind of written you off on the Yukon River. You know, the people on the field weren't really talking much about the guy back there in 20th. But then coming up the coast, just one team after the next, it seemed almost systematic. Yeah. What was what was kind of your mindset going through that as you were moving up the coast? Well, once you find yourself sort of out of the front pack almost, you have to figure out what your weapons are and what you can rely on. And I knew that this dog team was super tough and they're capable of being fast. And so speed is kind of relative in a year like this with a lot of snow, but we kept resting them and feeding them and taking care of them well enough that they could keep their speed. And, and uh, lo and behold, they stayed faster than the other teams around us and others just started falling off. So. Um, it was really something from the from the standing on the runners to just each run to outrun everybody and, and pick off a couple more and, and move up the, the rankings. So uh, there was no particular strategy other than give plenty of rest and take super good care of the team. So I think as we were watching the race, that was one of the things that seemed to stand out a little bit is that watching you race, it seemed like you knew what you were doing and what you wanted to do. How much of that is, you know, the strong suit is that you've you're on race number 27 here and a lot of a lot of the guys not all of them but a lot of the guys you were around, around have done five to, t to ten um, how does that change the race when you're racing out there yeah you, so we, we try to have a nice spreadsheet as you know and have everything all figured out with the numbers and by the halfway through the first run almost you can see that isn't going to work you know so yeah you have to have the experience, I think, and the underpinnings to know, like, well, is is four hours a long rest or is six hours a long rest? Or if I cut a little bit and take three or what's going to happen you know, to be able to predict. But I think for me, it's the overriding philosophy of take care of the dogs first and keep your speed. And that that helped to guide, you know, it's hard to sit there when people were... I mentioned something earlier, they're leaving on two and a half and three hours of rest and I'm getting further and further behind and still committed to taking four and four and a half. But I think that's how it really pays off and, and I think patience does come with the age part. How there are some sections out there with this deep soft snow that were clearly tough to get through. So is that a factor on the other side where you got some of the guys out there that are, you know, maybe your your children's age <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure who i'm thinking of there but you have some of them out there do you think that makes a difference for them or i mean i guess would you trade experience for youth i guess let's put it real simple i would not trade in a racing scenario i would not trade because i have found now that and by the way i feel better at the finish of this race than i felt almost ever and i think it's because i just don't freaking run i don't pedal very little. I, I did some today, long run today. I do a little bit, but I don't go out there and destroy myself. I'm taking after my dad. He's in his 80s. It's the dog's job to pull the sled. And you know, it's really true. So you work that into your breeding, your training, your nutrition. Have a big, powerful dog, 65, 60 to 65 pound males. What do I got to get off the sled for? So I, I don't think I miss too much on that. You know, that's, uh, I would say from the outside, we watched this race very closely every step of the way. And I was talking to Bruce and Greg along the way and, and other people, you know, from the outside looking in that were able to watch the live images and commentate on it. Um, what stood out was you knew what you're doing with this dog team and you knew what the trail would bring in an experience aspect. But it never was a factor from the outside looking in that, oh, he's having trouble in the hills. No, you were just as quick as everybody else when it came to doing stuff in the checkpoints, and it seems like that experience is why, you know, when we saw a pack of 10 mushers in Euloclete, and it was a coin toss for who was going to come out in second, who was going to come out in 10th, um, I think you had pretty much the best of both worlds there. So, yeah. anyway, thank we got to get you to bed, so yeah. get the rest of your stuff out of your sled. Good work. All right, thank you. Thanks uh, a lot. All right. Well, we're going to let him... Uh, get his gear out of there we have to go up find a warm place to lay down you know it's in the middle of the middle of the morning now you gotta remember we're having a coherent conversation more or less and uh this was a 12 plus hour run coming in here and this is the end of a nine and a half day race 
I mean, and that's that's what you got to go through, and that's the mindset you've got to be able to be in to still operate. You don't need to have the high highs and then crash at the end. And I think that's another thing that I've seen with some of the more experienced mushers on the race that I've had to race against, my dad included. They're steady. They're never going to be that bubbly, happy, bouncing around in the checkpoint, but they're never down in the ditch either. They're just always steady. They're they're the musher their dog team needs every single day along the way. So, anyway, Mitch C. V. in here in second place at the end of the Iditarod, 60-plus years old, fantastic race here. And I think it just brings it full circle that this sport is about coaching. Yes, it helps to be an athletic musher. Yes, it helps to be able to get your team down the trail. But if you are athletic and fit enough, which clearly he is, then the next one is how well do you coach that team? And when you look at any major sport, you don't see 20-year-old coaches on the sideline as the head coach. You see guys that have been out there and done this 27 times down the trail. So anyway... I'm pretty impressed here, obviously. Obviously, I'm probably a little bit biased as well, <laughs> but um, super proud of him, having just finished in second place. A phenomenal race there. So anyway, that was Mitch CV and Gnome. We're going to send it back to Norway. Thank you, Dallas. And like we heard here, uh, in the sport of dog mushing, you can be 20 years old and you can be 60 years old and it, it doesn't uh, age it's not uh, a topic here and like we heard uh, Mitch CV was really efficient at every checkpoint uh, uh, is it just about experience and and how can age be uh, a good thing uh, here Mats no me and Trond is very happy to hear that we still have the chance to win Aditarod so that's great for us then so <laughs> yeah there is for sure a, a experience thing to running this sled dog race it's experience thing to learn about the dogs learn about the trail learn about the, how you can handle the, the without sleeping uh, everything about uh, what happens and so on just be a dog person and there is so much different elements it's just not you have to throw the ball and in a good way or something like that it's just like so much different elements who make a good musher so so that's a big spectra over there uh, how uh, much or little sleep uh, do you must get during uh, i did a rod uh, Ailey, Ailey Circle did a study one year, she told me, she was here at, uh, visiting us for a couple of years ago. She did a study and told like, actually sleep on the trail during Aditha Road, she had 2.4 hours per 24 hours. So that was actually was the sleep. There is um, times when you lay down and so on, but she told she had 2.4 hours in general, uh, over 24 hours uh, per day in sleep. So th that's what she told me. They did some some checking about it and so on. So, but I can copy that and so on. You often lay down and so on, but maybe you don't fall asleep. Uh, but then yes, you have this longer rest, 24 hours, when you can re recycle a bit and so on. But I'm impressed this year by Thomas to actually to see him on the shake points. And so I, of course, he was tired in Koyuk and stuff like that. But the thing is, like uh, when we ran the 2015 race, he was much, much more tired than he was this year. Even uh, when I met him on the trail and so on. And he, now when I see him on the on the race and I see Mitch, everybody like this is also a big part of it. Like you have to handle it very well. You have to be focused. Yes, you're Royer very very good on that you can see like this is people who have been standing on the sled i told for the last 30 hours thomas was standing on the sled 24 hours straight and that's not for everybody no and and mitch has been the the oldest to ever win the iditarod as well and he seemed like he he handles it uh, well oh yeah exactly what it all like he, he also want to, I mean, he doesn't want to pull himself out, like running every hill. So he, want, he need to rest a little bit. When he stops, he take care of the dogs. And it helps a lot, of course. He's a small guy, not too much weight. His dogs are pretty big. He did this by purpose, having big, strong dogs, because he know he won't match the other ones to running up the hills or something like that, because he actually coming up to the age a little bit and he doesn't have it. But, I mean, he, he's an excellent dog coach person, and that helps a lot in this race. And uh, and uh, Trun, uh, you've been racing some yeah. long distance races yourself. Uh, how is it to be sleep deprived? Oh, it's horrible. That was one of my weakest points when I should be a 
go from be a regular musher to be a good musher, that was the number one problem for me. I, I'm the type of guy that always fell asleep first in parties. So <laughs> I had to go through years of hard work with myself and find out how I can deal with it. So when I, and when I after a year of hard work, I can deal with it very good. It's it's a, it's a you have to eat and you have to to think and you have to yourself in a special way and you all have different kind of techniques but if you first fall down and get so tired that you are almost out of control that's extremely painful and now all the dog rushers have been there in the long races and you feel that the body is shouting no and you, your eyes is is closing down and you can put snow in your face that doesn't help anymore very painful situation but um, when you're in the winning circle like Thomas is right now you have so much adrenaline in your body that you don't get that tired it's the worst thing to be back of the pack and uh, then you really feel it and it's a very very painful situation I can tell and uh, seeing Mitch CV and Thomas Werner now uh, they have reached the finish line and they they lay down for how long do you think that they will sleep now Not so much because the body hasn't been sleeping more than two, three hours the last two weeks almost. So, um, so um, they don't sleep so long. They go down into steady sleep, but they wake up after uh, two, three hours. And uh, in reflex, they want to go up and get out to the dogs and go out to the trail. The, the, the body is get used to the life. Uh, the, the body has been going, getting used to the, the life on the trail. So they won't have a, a long 10 hour good sleep. They will sleep, I guess, for two, three, four hours, and then they will woke up and then they will try to sleep again. That's that's how it is the first days, at least for me. I don't is... know what about you, Mats. But... Yeah, Mats, how is it for you? Yeah, the, yeah, the thing is like what really surprised you when you are on the race, when you are out there, that you see, you think to yourself, do I really need to sleep seven, eight hours home? Because I'm really feel okay when I sleep three, four hours on the race after a while and so on. So it's, it's like Tron saying, when they're coming to the finish line, you think, oh, if I slept four or five hours straight after that, I go up and say, oh, I feel really okay now because I got a couple of hours sleep. So so that's, you know, that's change, change a lot because you get used to not sleeping so much. And I think it's the same if you're home, if you're used to sleep 10, 12 hours per day, you need to sleep 10, 12 hours. If you're used to sleep six, eight hours, you sleep six, eight hours. So that's my point of view of this. To, to be honest, but yes, yeah, so. And uh, prior to the race, uh, we went to visit Thomas Werner at uh, his kennel in Torpa in Norway. The reason why I'm doing mushing is actually a question that I've been asking myself many times because it's a lot of work. For me, it is the nature and with the dogs and building a dog team. I think that's what I'm passionate about. It's uh, the bond actually between the dogs. And you have new puppies, you're working with them and you're seeing them develop to these great athletes. And then suddenly you have this incredible performance team that can just go for hours and hours. And uh, that feeling is so special, so I can't stop. <laughs> hey, Berge. Yeah. It's very important for me that the dogs are feeling good, feeling happy, having good attitude. I think actually these dogs maybe have a more happy life than us. They actually can do what they want to do every day. And that's actually being out on trips and just having fun. You know, we have to deal with bills and people and all the other things, but uh, they can do what they want to do. And that's chasing the trail. That's what I like. The bad thing with dogs that I really, really hate is that it comes a time when a dog has just lost the energy of a living. And that's actually when you have to go to the veterinary and, and say goodbye. And uh, that's always hard because it's, uh, you know, you spend so many hours with these dogs. You've done so many races. You've been so proud of these dogs. And suddenly when they are, you know, 12, 13, maybe sometimes 14, you know, they, something just happening in their, in their life. But I think the years they are living, this is dogs that can actually do what they want and they are just loving it. When I'm in the competition, I have a, you know, I like to win, but most important for me is to have the great team and actually go to the race and see that this is working. We are performing, we are able to go fast, we are doing all the right things. 
Actually, I think a victory in long distance is actually getting to the finish line. So I think if you're in the last place, maybe you will have a stronger feeling, you know, and you see people coming into the finish line crying and they are so emotional when they're coming in. For me, I get so proud of the dogs. You know, you're so proud of that team, how they are performing and, and you have worked with these dogs since they were puppies and, and now they are so these great athletes that are just performing on the level that, you know, you just think is incredible, almost impossible. And we're excited to hear where our other mushers are in the trail right now. Mats, can you update us on the map? Yeah, exactly. As I told, like, this is a race for winning, but this is also a race for much more than that. Many of you just want to finish, many of you just want to come top 10. We have a Rookie of the Year award, we have lots of stuff going on. So, so next musher in is uh, Jessie Royer. And she had a steady run all the way. You can say she did have a great great run and her team was uh, looking good and steady and not really high high speed and so on they they had a part of the race where they have to go in, in first and do some lot, lots of the trails when there was snow and so on but she she had an amazing run and coming into third place in this race after that this uh, brand says which we talked much before the race about also that i have with my top contenders i was thinking he can have a really good great race this year and he had it coming into fourth place probably he's pretty tight with aaron burmeister there and but i think he will come in fourth and aaron burmeister fifth place there so i think these guys are really happy about it coming top five in this race is probably been both of their, their goals you know so and uh, team number six now is the team that everybody talked about on this race this year, which has been looking so beautiful, running times, resting times, pace dropped me. And um, we have seen a little bit of that team, not too much, but uh, all the contenders, all the other mushers and so on, just talking about how great this team was doing, how great Paige had, how good run she had and everything like that. And moving up again, one incredible good musher, you are at at Olsson. He was uh, a little bit farther back for a while and coming back, but he always strong, strong finished this race. It's, it's so good to taking care of the dogs in the end of the race and make them going in a good run into Nome. So he looks like he's going to have a seventh place as it looks like here right now. Uh, eighth place, one of my favorites, as I told before, I'm really happy to see Brian Reddington coming in to top 10, first time in his career. He's been fighting hard for it. He is part of the Reddington families. They come from, from lower 48 up to Alaska and do the race, and he did the, won the big race race also. So I'm very happy to see Reddington in the top 10 this year. That's a battle going on between 9th and 10th place between the buddies Wade Morris and Travis Beals. They're living close by to each other, they know each other very well, so they do like a, a run into the finish line, who's going to be best of them to coming in the top 10. 11th place, also a team we haven't seen much, but I always told before, like, this is a team that can run fast, he has fast dogs, and he had a lack of experience himself, but coming into 11th place, Jesse Holmes looked like he will be very proud and happy with that. And 12th on this is Raymond Smith. The guy who is always fastest in the end of the race. He has the fastest running times from safety to gnome many years and he is, just, he is a master of taking out the best of his team in the end of the race. So he had, he had a good run coming in uh, 12th place so like it looked right now. And it looks like uh, we have Pete Kaiser there a little bit behind. He was last year's uh, champion, right? Yeah, Pete, Pete had some issues was a little bit surprising for me, to be honest. He had good running times and so on, but then he stopped for a long time. I think it was in before Unola Cleet and Caltag in that area. He got some issues going on. I don't really what, know what it was, but he got some problems there. So I think it took like 11, 12 hours at least rest. Uh, so he was out from the top contenders. But he probably you see that he need, he teams needed that and he needed the rest for them. And then he did it. So, And what make me really happy is also number 15, uh, the rookie of the year who ran an amazing good race. I'm very, I'm very impressed to see how she did it, Mila Porsild, because of the race. She, this is her first race ever on the road. But if you're looking at the running times, if you're looking at how she did on the checkpoints, 
and so on. It looks like a Masha who done this race many times. So for me, I was thinking she took a little bit less rest in some checkpoints and so on before the race. I was thinking maybe she lose some speed, but actually she has been having a really great speed between checkpoints in many, many, many places. So top 15 place for her rookie of the year. It is just very, very impressive. Thrun, do you know uh, Mille Parcel? No, I don't know her so so pretty well because uh, she is. Um, I haven't been that much in 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 Alaska, so so I don't know her. No, she's uh, she's uh, from Denmark, but yes, uh, Matt, uh, she's been doing many expeditions uh, in the Arctic before. Yeah, uh, we've been visiting him and you, her and you are before. They were had the kennel together earlier years. So I've been visiting them and see her dogs. She have another type of dogs, big dogs for expeditions, and she send out teams every year up to Nome and from Nome to, to Greenland and Russia and that area. So absolutely, she got experience from camping, being out with the dogs, but this is something different. This is to be on the race with lack of sleep, have a race schedule, a plan. It's not like camping all the times and so on. For me, this makes it a little bit more uh, like strong feeling because I mean she hasn't so much uh, much of that experience, but of course she's been in a kennel, she's been training dogs and everything like that. But impressive, really impressive to top 15 spots for her. And we have uh, another rookie, Tom Frode Johansson. Uh, how has he been doing in this race? Yeah, I'm very happy to see Tom Frode in the race. He was uh, talking to me pretty much before the race about logistics and so on. He done the quest a couple of times and he is a rookie in this race, but he's not the rookie at all otherwise. He's done Europe's longest race many times and he knows exactly what he's doing. He's a super happy guy and always ready to go and <clears throat> coming to top 20. I hope he's getting a top 20 finish, which is really great for, for him. So he's now in the 19th place behind the Ailey Circle, soon coming into White Mountain. So. So I'm very happy for Tom Froda and uh, this year this team was running the Yukon Quest also with Nora and she did a great work with them, taking care of them just along the trail, prepared them for Adita Road. And for my experience, the thing, dogs that run Yukon Quest and also run Adita Road, there's never been anything bad to do both races. They actually develop a little bit and if you do have an easy, pretty easy run in the Quest and don't push them too much, you can have a really great run on Adita with the same team of dogs. And uh, Brand Sass did that, didn't he? Yeah, he won. He won the Yukon Quest, and he have now a top four four finish this year. So Brand's uh, Brand's year has been really great, and he must be really happy. And uh, to have a place up in Eureka, a bit off the grid almost, and so on. So and tough training conditions. So uh, I mean, first place in Yukon Quest and fourth place in Adita is a pretty remarkable, really good year. Uh, uh, Thrun, is Tom Frode uh, uh, familiar to you? Yes, he is, uh, Tom Frode he is, uh, he's been running the Finnmarks race many, many times. Been in that race for many years. So uh, I know him as a, as a very good mercer and as uh, Mats said, he's, uh, he's always super happy. We call him the smile from Furuflaten is what we call him in, in my environment up in Alta. Always happy, always doing a great job with his dogs and always steady uh, so um so he's a good guy and i know how much he appreciate to come to didra this has been a dream for him for so many years so uh, good for him the, and, a, and a very good performance i think yes and uh, let's uh, switch our focus over to to jesse royer who will come in as, uh, as number three she has won uh, many many awards uh, this year and has come uh, into the checkpoints, uh, being the first into several checkpoints. Uh, what do you think about her performance, uh, Mats? Yeah, she's she's very pleased herself. You can see she has been like a big smile all the race this year. Like she's been in the front there, her team looking great, and she's been just happy and having mushers along her and the dogs looking great. So, I mean, her run this year has been really good. And as I told her, maybe take up a little bit Oh, it's a little bit of a edge. They were doing a lots of uh, trail breaking part of the time when there was much snow and so on. She didn't lose so much speed of it, but maybe the thing is like when you go first, some parts of the race there, maybe you lose a little bit of energy and so on. But she kept it very good. Look at the dogs coming in and they're looking fine. And uh, 
uh, Jess is very, very pleased with this. And what she's well known of, to be taking care of the dogs in a really good way and also like helping others is to have issues with the dogs or problems. Jess is, is the lady to talk to and she can give you a hand if you wonder about something. So lots of experience and she showing year after year now that she's there in top two, three. So yeah, she, she will be there for many years, I guess. It was very generous of her. I think it was in, in Ruby when she uh, came in, who was the first to uh, to the Yukon River. She shared her meal. They they get a was a three course meal, and she shared it with with Thomas Werner and Ewad and Aaron Burmeister and several uh, mushers. That was very generous of her. Yeah, it was. It was. It was not a really common. You, normally, you have a handler or some person. You, but she shared with the other ones, and I think at least it's a five or seven course uh, dinner they have there. And uh, yeah, looking really good. And she is talking about yeah, I want to have this food now, eat, and then I want to go to sleep. So it's not like sitting so much about relaxing and drinking wine. And it's more like we have to focus on the dogs. The food is good. It's great to have it there. And but it's more like yeah, are we ready now so we can take a nap because I want to head out from here. And that's what Bruce and and Greg also told them when they were there, like, yeah, it was nice to have a dinner, but yeah, we want to focus on the dogs. And this is what we do. We focus on the dogs and ourselves most of the way. It, uh, it will probably uh, be a, a very nice run. And I think she got in third last year as well. Yeah, exactly. It was second or third last year again. And she is also one of few musher that come to finish line with 16 dogs of 16 in it and a top 10 finish. A couple of years ago, I think it was three years ago or something like that, she finished the race with every single dog in her team to a top 10 finish, which is, to be honest, that's a dream for most of the guys to, to come and finish the race with all full string of dogs that you start out with and taking care of them and, and do a top 10 finish. And that's just show the, how great she is to take care of the dog. How, uh, how important do you think that is, uh, Trun, uh, to, uh, to finish with uh, several uh, and full team of dogs? Of course, in, um, that's, uh, that's something you can be very, very proud of, because it's always so difficult to keep a big team long in the race, especially if you are in the front and pushing and try to, try to win. It's, uh, it's so hard and it's so tough. So if you are able to keep a big team to the finish line, that makes you to be maybe the, 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 the biggest uh, dog person at all. That's the biggest thing, to have a, a big team. It's so difficult. It's, uh, it's a little easier if you take it easy and don't push so hard and maybe comes in, in, in 20th or 30th position. But, but when you are in the lead and up there in front, it is so tough. So if you're able to, 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 to have a big team in the finish line, it, it, that say, tells you two things. You have incredibly many good dogs. You don't have only five or six or seven key dogs, but you have very, very many good dogs, and you are an extremely good dog man. So that's the two things. I know, know that uh, there is a very few other persons that have been running very big teams to the finish line in Nome. For example, Jeff King uh, has also done it. So, um, so uh, that's great. That's great, and it's very difficult. And uh, and Jeff King, he uh, he was not uh, able to participate this year, but it was uh, another musher who who uh, had his team uh, this year, wasn't it, uh, Mats? Yeah, it was Sean Underwood who took his team in the last minute. He, the week before the race, he had to pull up and make an operation. So Sean Underwood took took his team and. That, that's a great opportunity to take the team to run into Nome. And Martin Boozer actually did a little bit the same. He didn't run the A team himself. You have Team Papas running his A team. So he ran the second, the B team this year on the race. It is, he is told like he want to check. So if, if he, he is the weak link of the race, of the team, we can have a younger guy up there and so on. But I think it's, as we talked about, Mitch is up there and there is other matches up there. I don't think it's about the age. I think it's more about the knowledge, uh, experience and everything like that. So it's the most important to be the coach of the dogs. Yes. Do, would, you, uh, would you agree to that, Trun? Yes, absolutely. I'm agree, and it takes um, takes many years to to learn everything about the trail and and how to run a dog team. And 
And you also need to stay steady in your mind all the time. And you have to be be used to that. Uh, it's always coming things that you you didn't know was coming. It's it's totally unpredictable to run a, a, a race, and and all these factors make you go ups and down in your mentality. And that's uh, and that's it's not good for the dog. So to stay steady, to be cool, and have ice in your stomach. That's something that takes years to work in. And that's why we, we often see there's many young young people in 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 a Didrod and Finnmark's race, but Usually the, the 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 top three or top five average age is uh, yeah something what is it 45 50 years old <laughs> and it's a reason for that and that's um, that's uh, it's it's so extremely tough and it takes takes many years to uh, to, to to get to know and deal with with everything. Hmm. You know uh, Thomas Werner very well, uh, Trun. How, how has he been? Uh, is he very steady or is that something he had uh, had to work with? Oh yeah, absolutely. Have to work with it. Uh, um, if you go uh, uh, 13, uh, 15 years back in time, it wasn't many that expected Thomas to be an Adidas champion for sure. Because uh, 15 years ago, he was really struggling with uh, with with running the, the long distance races in Norway. Um, everything was running up and down, and he was going out way too fast, and he had big problems. So um, he has Thomas has really been working hard. He has been find, figured out what's my weakest point and what do I have to work with, and he's really, really been working very hard. So now he's um, yeah, and that has really paid off, and he has been uh, been spending lots of time by um, by changing his way of running dogs from sprint mushing to long distance mushing and definitely because that's two very different kind of things but of course Thomas has been he's been one of the best sprint mushers in the world for decades before so you can't just switch over in in in, in one year but um, it, it took him about uh, five to six years to convert directly over and um, that including both how to change his mind and also how to change genetics and, and way of training and this is a pretty special year. Now we see some live pictures from Nome, and Mats, you said that it's usually so many more people uh, gathered uh, around there. But uh, maybe maybe people can show <laughs> show their their impression and uh, and support the teams by by other means like social media and uh, and cheer up their their favorite measure in that way. <laughs> I know that in yeah, Norway, that will. Uh, yeah, yes. I know that in Norway right now, everybody is putting flag out on the on um, on. Um, you, you're taking a flag outside your house and take a picture of it and post it on Facebook. Uh, that's something that uh, all mushers in Norway are doing right now. <laughs> Yes, that's a that's a good thing to do to uh, to motivate and show their support because uh, we talked to to Guru Thomas's wife earlier and she had to go home she couldn't be in Nome due to the coronavirus so it has been a special year uh, this year. Yeah, it's it's been a very special year and uh, you know I was up in Finnmark and should cover. The Finnmark's race, uh, the, the long Finnmark's race, 1,200 kilometers up in in Finnmark, Lapland, uh, and uh, at the end of the race, we had only 200 kilometers to go. They just shut the whole race down, very dramatic, and uh, and uh, but um, that was the way they had to deal with that in the north of Norway. So we should be very, very, very happy that this uh, it, it was able to pull this uh, pull this race off at all. I think so. But we can show support in. Uh, in social media, I think that's uh, we're pretty good at that. I think. Yes, and uh, and Mats, uh, how how is it usually uh, around uh, in in Nome for uh, for finish? Uh, it's a toy. Oh yeah, it's like a really party feeling going on there, and lots of happy people. We have Hobo Jim playing in the bars, and yeah, it's it's uh, it's very special. As I told, I've been there before when I was, didn't uh, run myself. I was visiting there and so on. I stayed at local people. I didn't have any. The thing with Nome, there is not so much place you can stay, and there's so much hotels and so on. So I run, I fly into Nome. I have no place to stay. I talk to the taxi driver. They invite me to their house. I was sleeping with them. There were local people there, and stay a couple of nights there, and 
visiting friends, going to bars and just discover and see the dogs coming in there and feel the atmosphere, which was really unique and really, uh, really special. There's no place like Nomen because that's what they tell and that's just the front street and it's bars and everything is happy and cheering when you're there and there have also a summer festival. And so Nome is a special place on earth. I can say that 100% sure. And uh, and seeing now, we, we we're waiting for for Jesse Royer to to take the the third position. Uh, is it uh, it's been more exciting uh, finishes than than this? Have you uh, can you remember some uh, months, uh, where you have been really chasing uh, someone else? Uh, this uh, running up to the finish. Yeah, myself has been like, but then we don't talk about finish. And the first, we're talking about some position, just like I have the same experience with Michelle and Lars Monsen and those. Like, you just want to have do this, uh, come to the best finish in the end of the race in the last leg and so on. But the thing is, like, it's every year, it's like this year, it's a little bit special because there was so big gap between Thomas and the rest already from Koyuk and in. That is not usually, that doesn't really happen so often. He, he made a gap in Juno Laclete and he didn't see the rest of the team for the running for first so he was pretty confident and calm on the trail because yeah, he didn't otherwise the things like looking back all the time you have some headlamp coming behind you and try to chase you and and often it's changing you know the position changes from <clears throat> from uh, white mountain and in it's not like they're they change the position they're changing right now also and so on and also can see, see the map maybe later on again if i can have a look at that there was talking about even you are also and page drop maybe maybe are on the wrong course right now but i see the the, the they're coming in now they're coming in a much now you can see the lights there yes is it a police car that is uh, showing the way yeah it used to be a firefighter's a police car jesse and there's royer there you got it front street, yes the royer coming in there yeah this year Jessie is 43 years old and was born in Idaho. She grew up at a cattle ranch in Montana where she lived for 21 years. She worked on ranch, <coughs> ranches as a horse wrangler and a horse teamster. She says she got her first sled dogs when she was 15 years old. She started learning about dogs from Doug Swingley, whom she worked with for a couple of years. She had dogs in Montana seven years before moving to Alaska in the spring of 1998. She won the Montana Race to the Sky when she was 17 years old, and she was a winner of the Invitational La Grande Odyssey in France in 2005. She said her hobbies are horses, hunting, and mounted shooting. Welcome, Jesse Royer. Step back, folks. Step back, please. Step back. Way back. Way, way back. You're going to have to move. Come on, to pass him. <laughs> Hi guys. Oh, and, ah. oh, good talk. That's a pretty good talk, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's good talk. Oh, are you girl? Wiggler. She did a little win. Oh, I see y'all. Good boy, Coulter. Good boy. Oh, now we're just making a boy. Oh, and the sniper. Hi. 
great. I don't know. You did a pretty good job, huh? That was a pretty good boy. That was a pretty good boy, huh? Yeah. Good boy. All right. Those lead dogs. Well, this is Sniper and Striker. But actually, Coulter, the black one, and Sniper led through the wind and, and over the Topcock Hills. But Coulter doesn't like all the people, so I didn't think he'd come up into the chute. So I actually just took him out of lead, like, right on the sea ice and then put Striker up here. But Striker's one of my main guys, though, too. But, uh, yeah, Stryker's been here before. He knows where the finish line is. Do you want to smack him or anything, or do you want to go ahead and check out? Um, we can go ahead and check out. Okay. So. Good job, Jackson. Thanks. Good job, Kittle. You go, Jesse. All right, we are checking Jesse out here to see if she has all the required gear. Yeah. Hey, since it's the only one in the world. So here's the vet book. Vet book, we see your dog booties. Well, right there. Yeah. Right there they are, yep. And I got a bunch more right here. Your axe. Right there. Okay. Snowshoes. Right there. Okay. Promotional gear. Uh, right here. So who take yeah, you take that. Sleeping bag. Right there. Alright. And then dog coats and cooker. Cooker. They're both back here. The, the dog coats and the cooker are both right in here. Sure. Uh, but you can All see right. the cooker down there and the dog coats right there. Alright. Jesse has all our required gear. The only thing we need is her signature on here. This will sign her off the trail in third position. Coming in in nine days, 17 hours, 47 minutes, and 16 seconds. Welcome to Nome, and congratulations, Jesse. Thank you. Jesse. Here's Jesse. How do you feel it right now? Oh, just happy to be done. So we got in some pretty good wind coming over the Topcock Hills. So typical for this race that doesn't want to give up at the end. It's going to be a fight all the way to the finish line. But uh, um, I had uh, Sniper and Coulter up in the lead, and I couldn't even see them half the time going over the hills. It was pretty severe <laughs> wind. I left White Mountain. They said it was supposed to be like 10-mile-an-hour winds and tapering off. So I thought, oh, I'm going to have an awesome run into the finish line. It's going to be easy. And then I got out there, and I was in, like, freaking ground blizzard and snow and blowing and headwind and <laughs> couldn't even see my team and I'm like so much for the pleasant trip in <laughs> but but uh, they did really really good though I never had to give them a command they found the trail the whole way in so Jesse that's two third place finishes in a row for you tell me how you're feeling about your performance well I think it was a pretty competitive year so I'm still happy with third you know it um yeah, there's just a lot of good teams, and there's a lot of good teams still yet to come in, you know. So I feel pretty, pretty honored and privileged to be here in this position, for sure. Were you thinking that you could beat Mitch for second place, or try for no. that? No, <laughs> no, he's been faster than me up the whole coast, so that that wasn't even a consideration. I was still just mostly making sure that I wasn't going to get caught from behind. <laughs> but, um, Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's all right. Uh, it looks like on the um, the top of the cape, you were moving around a little bit, like kind of down off the trail and then back. Did you, was there wind or maybe it was just the GPS tracker? Oh, that? I'm sure it was just the GPS tracker because okay. we were on the trail the whole way through. Perfect. Yeah. The wind wasn't too bad after safety. I mean, there was some wind, but the worst of it was before safety. So, yeah. Got lots of fans out there, people rooting you on. What is your message to them as you come in today? Oh, just never give up. You never know what's gonna, you know, how it's gonna finish or what you're gonna, uh, what's around the next corner, you know. So um, you just keep grinding it out and, you know, working at it and never give up. And uh, you always get to the finish line. So, um, yeah, I mean, I could have. Now, there's just a lot of good teams behind me too, you know, so um, I feel pretty, pretty
pretty privileged and honored to come behind, you know, come in behind uh, Thomas and, and Mitch, and they have two amazing dog teams as well, and so pretty happy with mine, with my dogs. Jesse, can you comment on Thomas and what you noticed about him and, and how he got this win this year? Uh, well, this is really my first r r time racing around Thomas, and uh, he's just a very pleasant person to travel with. He's always just fun to, to visit with and good to be with on the trail. And every time I saw his dog team, it was absolutely amazing looking. And I kind of knew clear back at Cripple that that was probably the team to beat because it was just so amazing. But he's just a lot of fun to travel with. Although I did have to give him a hard time in White Mountain because uh, uh, we never saw him after Caltag. And so when I saw him in White Mountain, I, t I was just joking with him. I said, I, I started to think you didn't like us anymore. You'd leave every time I come into a checkpoint, you'd leave. <laughs> and uh, he laughed. And I said, and, and even after I gave you that nice dinner in Ruby and you still didn't wait for me. <laughs> so he's like, I know, I'm ungrateful. I'm like, yeah. So <laughs> we had to give him a hard time because, you know, he had that, um, we all had that dinner in Ruby. So I was like, man, you'd think that would have accounted for something, you know. <laughs> No, I'm I'm happy for him. He uh, he did a great job. So he has a, just a beautiful dog team. You know, since this race started, you know, a lot has changed in this country. There's uh, dramatic concerns about a virus spreading. Uh, have you been aware of the news that has oh, been happening? And somewhat aware, yes, and 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 mostly just trying to ignore it because you know I run this race, and and uh, you know every, I run it. This is my 18th time, so. You get out here and it's just you and your dogs. You can forget about what goes on in the rest of the world. And it's just focused on your dog team. And I, and I like that about this race, you know. I always used to say that, you know, the world could be at war and I wouldn't know it. I'm just focused on this team. Well, now I can't say that anymore. <laughs> because obviously it did, it, does, it did affect this year's race. You know, the outside world did. But um, I still had to just stay focused on my team. And you'd hear rumors and kind of roll your eyes at what's going on. And I, you know. Seems crazy, but I'm still just was focused on my team. That's because that's all you can do. I mean, we're still in a race, and I still had a job in front of me to do. So I did it. Obviously, you're reliant on the team the whole time. But was there one moment that really stuck out to you that you were so grateful or uh, just really bonded to the dogs? I mean, the whole race has its different challenges, you know. So. Um, I mean, I can't think of anything that, you know, stuck out particularly, but I mean, just just how well those dogs even went through the wind coming. That was the worst wind we got in the whole race was coming over Topcock. And I couldn't even see them half the time. So, I mean, they did a pretty amazing job going up over all that stuff. So, yeah, they did good. This is his third Norwegian winning that I did, Rod. How are you going to beat them? Well, I don't know. I'll figure that out and I'll let you know. <laughs> Maybe, maybe we'll have it figured out by next year. I don't know. They have some beautiful dog teams over there. That's for sure. They um, they definitely uh, know what they're doing. And uh, the, the cool thing is, is they're all just super pleasant, awesome people, though, too. They're fun to travel with and visit with, and they're just good people. So I'm happy for them. It's awesome. So, yeah. All right, well... You guys ready to go, huh? Jesse Royer in third position. All right. Hey, guys. Okay. And uh, congratulations to, to Jesse Royer there, a great, uh, good-hearted uh, uh, musher. And, and Mats uh, Pettersson, I know you probably wanted to, to be out there yourself, but how has it been for you to follow the race uh, this year? I must say it's been amazing to follow the race and help to support a little bit about showing the great sport we have about mushing. And I think it's developed year after year to have better pictures of what we're doing, showing people around in the area, around the world, a good picture about what this race is about or what mushing is about. Beautiful scenes, beautiful nature, you, you meet everything out there. And I know what it takes for these guys to come to the finish line. I know how much work there is for everybody to come to the finish line, even if you come to first place, even if you come to last place, even if you get the Red Lantern, the Rookie of the Year, everything like that. So 
so being part of this and being helping out you guys to 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 do this with the with the studio and everything like that is just great because we just love this sport and the passion about dogs and what we want to show. And uh, Trun, you you are good friends with uh, Thomas Werner, the champion of this year's Adidas. How will you celebrate? I I think uh, the way I know Thomas is that when he comes home to Torpa, he just uh, he just call people in for dinner. You know, he's a very social person, as and he's doing a lot of the local environment up in the small village where he lives. He arranges uh, races and uh, and organize everything. So 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 I guess you have to celebrate with with some uh, good dinner and something to drink and some long talks about dogs and genetics for about ten hours nonstop before we fall asleep. So that's the way dog mushers celebrate. They eat and drink a little bit. And then they start to talk about genetics and how to train a dog team for, yeah, non-stop consecutive 10 hours. So what do you think, Mats? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was laughing here. That's exactly what happens, you know, that exactly we are a little bit in our bubble. And that's like we've been this week also in the bubble, uh, the coronavirus, everything around the world. Yes, it happens, but you are just there to do what we love to do. And maybe the best way to be out from it, just in the wilderness with your dogs. I think that's uh, that's that's what I'm going to do tomorrow with my team, at least. Thank you so much for staying with us live, Mats Pettersson and, uh, and Trun. Thank you. Now uh, we can write another champion's uh, name on the list of Iditarod finishers, and that's Thomas Werner. <laughs> 